almost over. And one of the things I like to do in the summer is go to the beach. Anybody here like the beach? Maybe not as much as you did when you were a kid. You know, there's a whole lot more options when you were young. You know, as I go to the beach now, I can't, I can't body surf anymore, and I can't play beach volleyball anymore, and those, those things that involve a large amount of running or physical activity that, as a young person, I could do, uh, can no longer do. But they're still fun at the beach, right? I like to watch people, and, and sometimes I, just to reflect on my own life at the beach because it was such an important part of my life growing up that, that I really enjoyed it. Um, and it makes me reminisce, uh, I heard a preacher talking about the beach this week and made me reminisce of, of how young people experience the beach for the first time. You remember taking your kids or, or grandkids or, or, or being around children who experience it for the first time. I like watching them, people about the beach doing it and how some children will just stand there and look at it, right? First time you approach the water, it's so big, isn't it? It's so huge, and the waves are so powerful. Think about it from a small person's point of view. How powerful even the smallest, the smallest waves must seem. And they stand there and they look at it and they contemplate it for a while, right? Some of them would just sit down and say, say well, you know, I'm just going to sit right here and play and y'all go out in the water. But some of them would venture out, right? At least initially, like they like water. And they and go out a little ways and what happens? Most of the time a wave knocks them down, right? And they get to taste that that uh, salt in their eye for that sting of the salt in their eye for the first time, or, or worse, it goes up their nose, right? That's the worst, right? Salt, <laughs> salt water up their nose, oh, that's terrible. And they say, you know what, I'm going to go build sandcastles. <laughs> and you all go play in the water, but I'm going to be over here building sandcastles where it's safe, right? You've seen that, right? You've experienced that. And usually they'll venture back out, but it's usually with like a parent, right? A parent will have to get them into the water to get them back in the water once they've experienced that sting, that hurt that the waves can, can bring to them. And as the parent brings about, sometimes they'll be on the hip because they're really secure and they're like, you've got to get them used to it. And they've got to get to know that, hey, it's okay. Right? It's going to be okay. You're safe out here. And then they, they or they may walk them out, right? You've seen them walk them out or you've walked them, your children out holding their hands, right? And say, I got you. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to jump waves, right? We're going to jump the wave when it comes in. You might start with a little wave, right? A little one that's just like a lap. You know, it's like, it doesn't even affect you, but, but they jump, right? You hold their hands and you pull them up and they jump. And they jump and they get secure and know that you're going to pull them up, don't they? And as you venture out a little bit deeper into the water, the waves start to hit you a little bit more and so they're really affecting them. But they're still jumping. They're still holding on. As, but as you're going out, the waves are getting bigger. Now, see it from their point of view, from a child's point of view. How big that wave may seem. It may just be hitting your knee. But if you're only knee high, <laughs> that's a big wave, isn't it? It seems intimidating, doesn't it? It seems like overpowering. I guess it might be the enemy. Here comes that salt up my nose again. That ain't happening. You know. And they get scared, right? They're like, you know, I don't want to. Let's, let's, let's stop, right? Let's go back in. And you're like, no, 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 no. no let, let, just one more. Just try. Just try. Just hold on and, and trust me and try. Right? And they hold on to your hands. And the big wave comes. And they got this fear. They, they really, what they really want to do is climb you. You know, <laughs> they want to climb to the highest point. But what they do is they're trusting. They hold your hand. And as the wave comes, you lift them up. And they get to squeal. They're just so excited. Right? They're so excited that they're a wave jumper now. They, they, they conquered the biggest wave in their life. And they're a wave. They, I'm a wave jumper. And, you know, and in reality... You have to laugh because you know they're not a wave jumper, right? They're a hand holder, right? You lifted them up over it. They, it really had nothing to do more than they had the courage and the trust to hold your hand and be lifted up over that wave, right? But that to trust and, and, and hold on like that takes what? Faith, and it? takes a little bit of, of faith. They, they're believing in us, right? As parents and grandparents or even friends, then we're going to lift them up when that wave comes. And we're going to take care of them. And as I, I prepare the sermon, as we're continuing on this, on this series of, of heroes of faith, you know, one of the things that came to me is that in that scene at the beach with the kid and the parent holding the kid, how many of us can find ourselves in where we are in our faith journey? How many of us are sitting on the beach because we've been hurt before and we're really afraid to go play at all? 
I'm going to play right here. It's safe here. Right? I believe in God, but I need God to be at a distance. And it's really safe to sit right here on the beach and play in the sand. I got my shovel. I got my bucket. Life's good. I don't need anything else. Life's good. But some of us, some of us have braved the waters. And some of us have gone out there and, and, and trust. And I only trust so far. You know, I can only trust God with... He can only handle certain size problems. God can't handle the big problems. I just need to trust Him when the waves are just lapping at my feet. You know, and I can jump those waves, right? Because if He doesn't have my hands, I can, I can probably get over them myself. You know, and, and, and that's kind of our, our faith right there. That kind of, I believe in God, but not too big a God. I believe in a powerful God, but not too powerful. How many of our faith is there? Or how many of us venture out into the water and got our hands up like, come on, next wave. Because I know God's got me. Right? My hands are up and I know He's going to pull me up over that wave when it comes. How many of us have that faith? And if you had to examine your life and you had to really think about it, where exactly do you stand? That's a good question. That's, a, that's one of my best questions. I mean, and I want you to think about that. Where do you stand? Are you sitting on the shore? Are you wading into the water? Are you all out there and you're all in with your hands up in the air saying, God, I know you got this no matter what life throws at me. You're going to lift me over that way. The person we're going to talk about today, is his name is Joshua. Joshua was definitely all in, hands up, knowing God was going to lift him up no matter what happened. He was all believing. He was all in, as we've said before. He had all his chips pushed in. He believed that God could do anything. You know, as we heard today's scripture, uh, uh, well, let me give you a little history on Joshua. Joshua had been with Moses since they left Egypt. And, and he had seen God do wonderful things, hadn't he? As they wandered the desert, God had fed the people, right? He provided the manna and quail, right? He had part of the Red Sea. He had seen that. He had seen the Egyptian army drown in the Red Sea, right? He, had know, he knew that God had provided for his people for, for 40 years in the desert. But you know, he was also with them when they came to the promised land the first time. And he was one of the 12 spies that went over to see, you know, to, to check out the promised land. Is it safe for us to go over in there? What do you think we should do? And they came back and Ken said, man, there's, there's giants over there. We don't want to mess with those people. They're big. They're way too big. We can't handle that. We don't need to mess with them. But Caleb and Joshua said, no, we can take it. We got this. God's with us. We, look what he's done for us. Let's go to the promised land. Unfortunately, there's only two. Ten to two. If we're on the board and we vote, then it's 10 to 2. Where are we going? We've got to go in the desert for 40 years. And that's where they went. So they had wandered around the desert for 40 years. But now Moses has died. And Joshua was his second in command, so to speak. So Joshua takes the reins. And Joshua has taken them into the promised land as God directed. And doing so, God parted the Jordan, right? And they walked over on dry land. So again, he's seen God's power. He knows God's with them. He knows this is the direction that God wants them to go. They've already had several battles. And they've won. They've conquered the city of Jericho. Remember the walls come tumbling down. They march around the city. The walls come tumbling down. So he's seen that. Now this is all takes place before the scripture that we read today. And in seeing this, the people in that area were starting to get scared. You know, we read about that when we talked about uh, Rahab. Rahab, thank you. Rahab, right? As well as Middleman. Rahab, right? The people were already afraid. They had already heard of this God who had part of the Red Seas, who had drowned the, the Egyptian army. He already knew about all that. So, so the, the people from Gibeon, which was a major city, had come and made a treaty with the Israelites. So, you know, we're going to serve your God. We want to be, we don't want, we don't want, we don't want none of it. You know, we don't want to fight you. We want to, you know, we want to uh, be peace, at peace with you. So they had signed this treaty. Well, when the other five kings of the major cities heard about this, they got mad at Gibeon. 
And so they all came together and attacked Gibeon to wipe them out. And that's where we picked up the scripture where today, in today's thing, where, where the, the people in Gibeon are under attack and they send a message to Joshua, come help us. We need help. Don't, don't forsake your servants. Please come help us. So he marches all night long. He takes all his troops. He takes his best troops. And he marches all night long. And when he gets there, he, God tells him, he said, he tells him something very important here. It's important that you hear this part of the scripture. He says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand withstand you. Let me read that again. I probably did a bad job. Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. I should have something there. God's already given them into his hand. God's already been there. God's already fought the battle. And it, God's time is. God knows. The victory is his. You see, so, so, so Joshua is fighting... Joshua's fighting from a place of victory. He knows there's going to be a victory. He's not fighting for a victory. He's fighting from a victory. How many of us in our daily struggles fight from that position? So you see, that's a faith thing. It's a faith thing knowing that God goes into battle for you. And He fights your enemies for you. And that He is with you in the battle. Carrying you through the battle. Because it changes the way you approach the battle, doesn't it? If you know you already have victory. The victory is mine. If I tell you you're going to win, no matter what you do, you can stand on your head, you can crawl. You can do the hokey pokey. It doesn't matter. You're going to win. Right? That makes a difference, right? When you know God goes with you, not you think God goes with you, I sure hope God goes with me. Maybe God to go with me. Somebody please send God to go with me. No, when you know it, because of your faith that God goes with you into your daily battles, you approach those daily battles differently, don't you? He knew they were going to win. And he fights this battle, and sure enough, they're just beating the tar out of them. I mean, they're just annihilating. And, I mean, it, the, the battle's going good. I mean, as good as a battle can go. And they're running, and they're chasing them, and they're running, and they're chasing them down. They're going to annihilate them. They're going to wipe them out. The problem is they're running out of daylight. The problem is, you know, 24 hours in a day, that's what you get, right? I mean, only so many of them are going to be daylight. And the sun's going, starting to go down. And at that point, Joshua prays the most outlandish prayer probably ever pray. I mean, it's better than moving mountains or, or parting seas. He asked for time to stand still. Yeah, seriously. That, def that defies all laws of physics. I mean, that's, he, he's asking for God, let time stand still so I can finish this today. So I can wipe out these people who are against, against your people. Let time stand still. Now, that sounds kind of silly, don't it? I mean, that sounds ridiculous. If you got up today and prayed that, how many people would chuckle? You know. You, don't, you, don't, you know. You might be one of the chucklers. Uh, I mean, that's, a, that's kind of a ridiculous thing, right? But Joshua had the faith to pray that prayer. That's outrageous faith. That's crazy faith, isn't it? To pray for the impossible. I mean, that's what he prayed. He prayed for the impossible. But God delivered. Because we know all things are possible with God. Even Things that we as human beings deem as impossible. See, I, 
I don't worship a small God. I, I don't worship a God that fits in my pocket. I don't even worship a God that fits in a shoebox. Or a big box. Or a house. Or a church. I worship a big God. And my God, I hope is the same God you worship. <laughs> All things are possible through my God. There's nothing too big for Him to handle. There's nothing that's going to overpower Him. There's nothing that can rise up against Him that will defeat Him. You see, my God, <laughs> my God is an all-powerful God. My God doesn't lose. And I have faith in Him that whatever, whatever He deems for me is what it should be. And I'll trust in that. Whatever that is, I may not like it. Some days are like that, aren't they? Cards are down, you're like, man, these are terrible cards. Can we get a redeal? I'll play the cards I got with the God I got. Trusting in the God I got to lift me over that way. Right? You see, that's that's what really faith is. Is asking for that incredible, that impossible. The thing that makes us look ridiculous, when you have really true faith, you don't worry about what other people are thinking. Because you know your God is working on your behalf, isn't he? You know that your God loves you, right? We're already told that. We know that. You rest in that assurance. For God so loved the world, and as far as I know, we're all part of that, <coughs> that He sent His Son. So we rest in that assurance. He loves us. He's working on our behalf. But do we have the audacious faith to walk out to the water and put our hands up? And say, lift me over this wave, God. It's a big wave. And I'm a little bit scared, but I know you got me. Or do we sit on the shore? Say, I ain't playing. <laughs> I'm good right here with my bucket and my sand shovel, and I'll be good. I'll make me a little shake here, make a little sand castle, dig a trench. I'm good just sitting here on the water. I'm playing. You see, God calls you to have more than a sitting on the sand kind of faith. He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to develop that relationship with Him that no matter what you go through, you know that He'll see you through it. You see, Joshua had been through a lot of things with God in heaven. He had been through the desert. He had been through the, the, the male, the, the manna and the quail. He had been through the part of the Red Sea. He had been through the part of, the, of, of Jordan. He had been through battles where God had delivered battles. Him and God had history, right? They had a relationship. Do you have a relationship? Do you have history? You see, because through that history comes that trust. It's just like any other relationship that we have. Whether it's with our spouse, our children, our, our friends. Through time and through trials comes trust, doesn't it? Right? I'd like to say you're my friend, but I don't know. If I call you at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're going to pick up the phone? Good question, isn't it? Good question. Good friends pick up the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning. Just saying. If you're not a phone picker upper. <laughs> you know. But but in reality, that all comes through going through trials together, doesn't it? How many of you have been through a trial before? Right? I heard I heard this written somewhere, I saw this written somewhere. For every test, there's a testimony. So if God's put you somewhere and He's carried you through it, you have a testimony. You have something to share with other people. You have something to build on. You have something to bank on. You have somebody to trust in, don't you? Because you've been there. And yeah, but I've only been in the small ways. Well, then step out to the deep water, brother. Step out to the deep water. You see, you can't experience the deep water sitting on the sand. God sometimes calls us out of our comfort zone. He calls you to do something that seems ridiculous. Like me up here preaching. He, he, he calls us to do things that, that are out of our comfort zone. There are things we never imagined we would do. But He has given you the gift to do them. If He's called you to it, 
He will get you through it. I promise you that. But you got to believe. Doesn't matter what I believe for you. You got to believe. You got to embrace that. You got to step out into the deep water, put your hands up, and say, I'm ready. Lift me over that wave. Let's go. Let's ride. Let's ride. Let's, ride. <coughs> Let's go for it. Because when you have that kind of faith, you're going to experience life in a new way, an exciting way. A way you've never, never even imagined. And you're going to see things from a different point of view. Because things are different in the deep water than they are in the shallow. It takes a different trust level. It takes a Joshua kind of trust. A Joshua kind of faith. Do you have that faith? I'd like to think I have some of that. I probably don't have nearly as much as I as I need. But I'm working on it day by day. And I hope you are too. And I hope you'll examine. I hope you'll examine where you're at. It's personal. It's between you and God. But I pray that if you're still sitting on the shore, that God will get you into the water. And if you're just stepping into the water, that God will get you into the deep water. Because that's where the fun begins. God, I want you to put your hands up and say, I'm all in. Take me over the way. Will you answer that call? The question only you can answer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.